I will call uh, this meeting uh, to order. Uh, quick um, roll call. Um, Aaron Gallagher. Yeah. Al Charles. Here. Dave Callahan. Um, uh, Superintendent Jagir. Uh, Dr. Rogers. Uh, Dr. Dutch. Uh, Paul Murat. Uh, Superintendent Paul Murat. And uh, meetings being recorded by Franklin Matters. Thank you very much for that. All right. Um, all right. We've got Zoom going as well. But uh, now, although I'll just kind of take it over to uh, Superintendent Jagir. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. So uh, the purpose of the meeting tonight is to review the feedback from the forums, the updates from the architect and the uh, master planner that we're using, Locker, um, and share as much information as possible. I mentioned this earlier today in a few meetings, but as we talk about this information, we've been engaged in facilities conversations for multiple years. I know that a report was published in 2020, and since then, you know, we've seen the closure of one elementary school, but in the meantime, we did a redistricting analysis last year. It's all basically part of a long journey to really look at how should we be organized as a district based on our enrollment, our facilities, and how do we set ourselves up for success. Uh, we're gonna share as much information as we have with you tonight and make sure that, you know, I think what would be most important is talk through the details that we have available, what themes are emerging to try to provide as much information as possible, and then also talk about a communication strategy to make sure that our staff and our community are brought up to speed as well on um, some of the ideas and themes and concepts that are being coming to a head, um, and which would result in options. Just to walk people through a timeline, we basically have this comprehensive facilities analysis subcommittee meeting. We'll talk through some of the ideas and concepts that are emerging with options. Next Tuesday, at the school committee meeting, one of the topics will be to talk with the whole community and the committee on the options that have emerged. At that point, it'll be an opportunity to share, get public input over, over time. But ultimately, we want to see uh, the school committee have the information they need and uh, arrive at some decisions by middle of May in order for us to plan effectively for the future. Any decisions made would not take effect until 2025, the fall of 2025. So I just would say that, like, I don't even, it, regardless of what the plan is, if, the, if you take a vote of action, we need a full school year to prepare for whatever that way may look like. So um, without further ado, I think what I'd like to do is kick it over to Dr. Dutch to go through the feedback forums. He's provided a summary along with some further detail. And then we'll get into some of the options that are emerging so that this subcommittee knows and we can get this out after the fact, after we have a conversation. Any questions so far? But I will say one of the things, um, just thanks for just kind of the acknowledgement of like the fall of 2025. Because that is something kind of hurt yeah. when people are just kind of wondering what's going on and when is it going on. And just so that way there's a, a clear understanding that whatever comes out of this committee, whatever's kind of you know talked about and decided and out of the, the full school committee, um, you know we're not talking about the school year coming up, you know for, for this fall. So thanks just for kind of putting that in the Sure. And we'll provide uh, more like this in writing to the community as well and opportunities as we move forward. So this is just a subcommittee meeting where we need to bring you up to speed before we bring the full committee and get your feedback and input and then keep moving through the process. That's how it works. So with that said, Bob, do you want to walk through the forums that we conducted? And sure. Um, I gave you the first document, which is um, kind of dense with material. Um, it's a reference for you to read through later. The second form that I gave you is a, is a summary, and I'd like to walk through that summary with you, and you can always refer back to the, to the larger document if you want. So as, as you know, uh, and as Lucas mentioned, we've gone through a, a series of steps in the process of comprehensive facilities planning, uh, including visioning. And uh, visioning um, has been led by Dr. Locker and her group. Um, they did the um, workshops where the focus groups, I should say, uh, for the portrait of a graduate, and then the visioning 
um, focus groups. Out of those focus groups came some vision as to what we think we should see. Um, that was then presented to these forums. So the, the forums occurred with five different groups. You had secondary school faculty, community members, elementary school faculty, students, and the administrative team. They were all asked the same questions, all provided the same information. So they got information related to the focus groups and what, what they um, were recommending. And then they were asked, uh, as they related to the portrait of a graduate and facilities, what their hopes were for Franklin Public Schools, what their concerns were for Franklin Public Schools, and how they thought we could mitigate, what were the mitigation strategies related to the concerns. So I've, I've summarized the hopes, concerns, and mitigation strategies, not by uh, constituency, but just in general. Um, you can always refer back to the, the original document, as I, as I mentioned, so that you're not relying solely on my summary of, of that document. So the summary of, of hopes included meeting the needs of students effectively, more effectively and efficiently. A thoughtful, strategic plan that has minimal negative impacts and to not lose the community feel of our schools. Equity in resource allocation, facilities, staffing, student representation in, in each school, demographics, and then class size. So those were the primary big picture hopes that came about as, as themes. Then the summary of concerns were buy-in, and that included buy-in from students and families, teachers, and community members who don't have a connection to the Franklin Public Schools. Another concern was the budget, so the impact of all of this on students, the lack of involvement, staff transiency, and which buildings are remaining. A third significant concern was division within the community if communication was unclear. Transportation was a concern, particularly the distance and time that students would be on a bus. There was concern that there would be fewer resources. There was concern around staffing and class size. And then the timeline for all of this was a concern. If you jump to the second page, mitigation or summary of mitigation strategies, in most cases, it's going to be the counter to what the concerns were. Um, but in some cases, not, not always. Some were more specific, um, and some were a little bit more, more generic. First one was keep the portrait of a graduate at the center of decision making. The second strategy was to foster buy-in, to address the concern. Um, they wanted to make sure that the plan was thoughtful, the vision was clear, and that there was transparency. And those all refer back to some of the other um, concerns. Carefully consider where different grade bands are housed to maximize the sense of community. That was came across in a lot of the different table groups across different um, structures. There's, there's the sense of community with the community schools, obviously. Um, and they want to make sure that when you go to, if you go to larger schools, that there's still a way to maintain that sense of community. And you'll, you'll see when uh, Lucas speaks to um, the overview of recommendations that that's significantly taken into consideration as we look at those. Um, and then some very uh, specific, uh, a very specific 
mitigation strategy, consolidate middle schools into fewer but larger. They also want to consider the equity of socioeconomic status, and I think that goes back to making sure that each school is representative of diversity, that it, that it isn't um, all students are similar in, in, one, in one way. They also suggested look at other schools that are doing what we're recommending to do. So once a decision is made as to the direction we're going, to take a look at other schools to take guidance from what they've learned, both positive and negative. And then finally, the last piece was publicize a timeline. I think that goes back to transparency and making sure that there aren't surprises and that people know whatever we do and when it's going to happen. Okay? So that's, that's kind of a summary. Um, I, I don't know if anyone has questions related to any of that information or if you just want to get right into the big picture recommendations. Um, so I'll, I'll open it up to questions first. Okay. So I'm going to give these out. Yep. So the architects got back to us after the April break with some information. So a as you recall, we did the envisioning and we did the educational adequacy walks where the architect walked through spaces, every school, every building. I'm holding up for you now a facilities assessment report that you may recall existed in 2020. One of the problems, not the problems, but one of the things that needed to happen with the recommendations in there involved, hey, uh, before any of this can be considered, you need to be thinking about a master plan in order for this to move forward, okay? So, they walked our buildings, They've done the count. We had the enrollment projections. I shared an example of that last night as well, just around how we're looking with our enrollment. And basically, building off of the plan that we had, but trying to verify the spaces, such as special education, specialized programming, um, and the spaces that we have. Basically, uh, the first page is just a map of our how we're organized. It's, that's current. Yeah. The first top page was current. Yeah. And the second so, page, you could number as option one, and the second page is option two. Correct. So basically, the options they've come up with to kind of set this up and put this in an, in an understandable way is basically, as we look at the district, imagine every school is sitting in a room, and they're all at tables, right, where the school is located. And we're asking every school to stand up and, and stand around the sides of the room and let's look at all the tables and see how we're organized and what makes the most sense. That's an analogy that I use. And when we conducted the redistricting last year, we were solving what ended up becoming one table group. And we were trying to figure out how to make that table fit differently. And we realized that we needed to do, the recommendation was to look at this from a master plan perspective. The first document that you have, there are two options that have emerged that both involve one thing. I'll start with middle school. According to Dr. Locker, as you heard, uh, you may have heard previously and through the forums, we have three middle schools that operate between 315 uh, and 350 kids ish. Um, if I'm just, um, uh, thank you. Um, and they are small for middle schools uh, at that point. The recommendation to unify middle schools has been on the table for some time, but it needed to be vetted and whether that could happen. You'll notice in both of these examples, the feedback from the forums, some of the committee, you heard uh, Bob mention uh, classes and equity around how we're organized as a district. They recommend the unification of the middle schools into one location. Remember, everyone stand, stood up and is all, out of the dance floor and putting all of the middle schools together at the Horace Mann Oak Complex uh, existing there. That means Oak Street can't sit back down at that table because now we just put uh, middle schools there, correct? So then when you move forward and you look at the rest of our buildings and the space that we have, uh, having the complexes that we currently operate with operate as basically elementary complexes. And here's where the options come in. 
and there's, there's two, basically. You're basically looking at the town and looking to create a northern elementary school that would exist at the Annie Sullivan Helen Keller complex and a southern um, co elementary complex that would exist at the Remington Jefferson complex. Okay? Uh, everybody with me so far? Mm -hmm. uh, in the options, and this was really interesting in the forums, where the first thought that came out of this was one option was okay, put all of our K to two students together in one building. Creates a big elementary school uh, for a K to two and put them in one of the complexes and then have them transition to a different complex for a three to five. So that's what you'll see illustrated in one of these examples. Um, through the forums it became clear that there were other ways that you could do this. Okay. Now remember everyone stood up from the tables but now we've just asked Kennedy and Oak and Parmenter and JFK and Keller and Jefferson to mm -hmm. all sit back down and depending on basically where the students are located geographically, right, yep. in, in this example one is a K to two at one building and a three to five at the other complex. The second option, which I think through some of the mitigation and some of the visioning and the work that was done in the forums looks at the opportunity to create a K through five experience at the Remington Jefferson School mm -hmm. and a K through five experience at the Helen Keller Annie Sullivan School. So as a family, if you think about it, your kid would travel through the same complex um, from K to five, right? Um, what that does create is, on the left and right side of those complexes, you're basically creating um, sister schools, where it's a K to two at, I'll use Jefferson as an example, and a K to two at Keller, and then a three to five at Remington, and a three to five at any Sullivan. So the second option has it set up that way. Um, those are the two that have emerged. They are working on mapping and they are working on the classroom layout. One thing that I noticed last year, and Al, you may recall this, when we looked at the T charts and the graphs and capacities, we, uh, we found ourselves kind of living in that kind of T chart world. And one of the pieces of feedback that I, I, I think we shared in that was I want visual maps of how we're laid out by grade so that it's very clear on how this could, could work. There are opportunities in both of those options, but ultimately what we've come to learn is we could uh, unify our elementary schools and our middle schools and exist in those, uh, in those formats and configurations. And if I look at our enrollment, uh, currently at two th for, for elementary school at 2052, um, projected to go to 2150-44 by 2032, that's, that's all still based on 60 new houses built per year, which we talked about last night. 62 houses were built over five. Jerry McKibben himself has said that these estimates are a bit high. So if you're averaging about 2,000 kids for the next 10 years, they fit in the buildings, 1,000 in one and 1,000 in another. And if you break that up even more, it's 500, 500 if you look in K to two. Do you get what I mean by yeah. the breakdown? Yeah. So you create the, uh, the, one of the goals was around a smaller community within a community and trying to think geographically. Uh, I think there are some options there for the school committee to consider when it comes to a vote. Both options uh, allow us to consolidate resources in schools and sections. Right now we're running some, some classes that have only two teachers per grade while some schools have five per grade. Um, and I think we're, we've, we've seen that. I think balance came up, I know, in the admin focus meeting was around trying to create more balance and sustainability. Um, and like I said, recognizing there's a lot of change for, for uh, this type of conversation, but this is not a new conversation and none of the concepts I'm sharing haven't already been put on the table four years ago. Um, it's just we're at a point now where we realize that if, if we needed a master plan, we needed one, we need to project out forward but these have become two viable options for us to, to consider. The last thing I will mention is that would mean that the JFK school and the Parmer school would be unoccupied as schools because you'd be consolidating to the two complexes. Um, I've talked about thoughts on um, you know, how we would move forward and what we could do in that, those particular cases. One thing we have to consider is ECDC is uh, above capacity. So I think we have to think about big picture and how that could look. Uh, I will end with the timeline of all this is. Any vote from the school committee 
that results in action, we need over we need the whole school year to plan and figure out how we're going to do this thoughtfully, successfully, and whatnot. The architects have worked really hard to help us look at the space. They've consulted with the special education department department to look at um, our in in district programming and specialized programming to see how it fits to make sure there's room specials. There's more work to be done, but the idea is that we needed to, what we thought was rather than wait until we have a perfect plan all buttoned up. We're trying to give you all, and we will, we will put out something in writing to the community about this so that people can start to wrap their heads around this idea. Mm -hmm. um, transportation. There are things that we're aware of that we need to plan out, and by uh, Tuesday night in school committee, one of the topics of discussion is to present uh, these options if this, if this group's, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you're on board because the whole point was to get to arrive at decisions for a master plan, mm -hmm. and we need to put this out to the full school committee last school committee meeting that was the sentiment that we heard so without any delay the next calendar school committee we've had since we talked about that we want to deliver on that and share this information and provide an opportunity for the public to engage but ultimately keep shoring up our plan and I'll end there and I'll open it up to any questions that you have at this point um, first uh, thank you very much for this it's kind of layout and I just wanted to confirm that her, because uh, I know with the last KBA report, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't kind of properly uh, take into account the specialized services, and, and that was one of the issues that kind of led to other issues. So with this one, with looking at all the numbers and the enrollment mm -hmm. in the specialized services, everything's still going to fit. Everything's going to fit. Perfect. Okay. And just to be clear, KBA's report did say we did this study. But we acknowledge that a master plan would need to happen in order for us to finish it. Mm -hmm. So it's not yeah. that they deliver. I just want to be clear because sometimes, it, like I was very protective last year during redistricting to not just take this at every peak because it acknowledged that we needed more info. I feel like they've done the work. Uh, Kate Jessup, the educational architect, walked every square foot of every building, mm -hmm. took detailed notes, has put together and synthesized this information. Jerry McKibben, who we have a trusted resource in what we believe is projections and forecasts to show. I think all this is now done, and I think we filled in the pieces that we needed in order to feel confident about um, some movement. But we have some schools that are under, and we have some schools that are over, and it's not a simple problem to solve. And in this case, I don't want to keep coming back to the drawing board on this year after year, and I think we owe it to the community to put together a long-range plan, and I support these options moving forward if we're going to try to also um, operate within the amount of space that we need and try to prioritize some of our facilities that um, are newer and fewer, as you mentioned, but ultimately try to live within those particular uh, spaces. And I think that's where we leverage those. So part of this is sustainability. What I will say is this type of work does not change the conversation we had last night. Uh, we still have a, a budgetary issue that um, we're advocating for an override to solve, but this is also a measure of whether we had a healthy budget or an unhealthy budget, we should be doing this and looking at this and, and, and having an honest conversation about the direction we need to move, and I stand by that, and I feel like they've done the work to present information, and we'll continue to provide more detail. Thank you. Um, questions? Um, go ahead, go ahead. Sure, um, so I thank you for the, the approaches. I, I think they make sense. I, I'm going to say option two, you probably shouldn't even think about and put on the table. Well, option two is to be nice. Yeah, green. can we be clear so which options to uh, start? Uh, big Sorry. green map. Big green map, yes. Oh, okay. green. And, okay. and, and my, my yeah. concern here is this. Um, at this point, we're going to be at the whims of bus costs because yeah. everybody's going to be yeah. costs. Yeah. So, yeah. And, 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 yeah. Any, any savings that we get operational just goes out the window at that point. So, mm -hmm. I don't even think that's what we consider. In, in the parent forum, we came up, uh, in, in one of the tables had had more of a discussion about this. They talked about, too, if you have a second grader at one school, and can you imagine the mass exodus of leaving one complex to drive across town to the other? Oh and, it thought, you know, and it also yeah. loses that community feel that Dr. Locker talked about, too. Yeah. So. And the other piece to add, the students even chimed in saying there's too many transitions with that one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. They said you never develop a community when yeah. you're having that yeah. type yeah. of option. Agreed. So yeah. it's the high school students even came up with yeah. that. So. I know in um, a kiddo on Daniel Street, it still takes them 40 minutes to get to Keller 
only in this one corner of the town. So it's like imagining them going right. all the way well, down here, I'm like, oh gosh. I'm looking where I am, and I'm looking at yeah. you know, where, like, yeah. like, that's, that's a that's distance. Nice. Yeah. yeah, yes. Okay. So, so at this moment, are you currently developing plans for both of these scenarios right now? Are they both yeah. continuing to be built out? They're, or? they're both, they, they are developing, like, down to the map level. Like oh, okay. building building maps. Yeah. Build, okay. They're they're yeah. developing those um, as okay. part of considerations. Okay. Certainly, I, I think at, at at some point next Tuesday, we'd be looking for or the fourteenth a recommendation from the school committee as to which direction to go. So I do have some other questions. Um, so the first one, the splits, makes sense to me logically. The sister, the sister school idea? Yes, yeah. And I appreciate the, the way we're using them wisely because I think that, that you, so you still have that progression from the younger to the older grades and that separation. Yeah. And it, 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 there's that growth that you can still experience in that community as well. So mm -hmm. I like that approach. Um, where I'm question a couple of my questions. So the ECDC, and the ECDC renovation. Can you elaborate on like what, what's the thoughts there? So uh, one thought, Mrs. Morano and I met sorry. this morning. Um, Mrs. Taylor's here, our ECDC principal as well, who's uh, engaged in this. We've talked about, as we all know, the piece that's not in here is movement of ECDC at this point, right? The idea of expansion, we've expanded into Horace Mann, and the concept here would be we need to expand into another space so that ECDC can live in the building that it's in but have um, another option. So without getting too far down the road, I don't know if I want to go too far down the road on this probably, but we're developing plans to utilize um, you know, uh, Kennedy and some existing space for options. I told you last night, I think I mentioned it, I toured um, a neighboring community around um, daycare options and then looking at space to try to utilize. Um, but that's really about um, trying to figure out the space. So we try to organize our kids first and prioritize the academic needs of students. But in the same regard, you know, this is the value of going to a neighboring community. And I'll tell you if this sounds familiar to you. A plan, master facilities plan takes place. There are recommendations to consolidate schools into some grade level bands. What that leaves one school vacant for the remaining lifetime. Does this sound familiar to you? And then basically, um, they've reutilized and repurposed that for the purposes of a daycare and then generate um, um, revenue. But I also see opportunity there without getting too far into it. We've talked about some potential ways in which we could expand and try to utilize space in a way that's effective. Because okay. I was thinking along those lines, but what I was thinking was the ECD expansion is the ECD primary, and then the e legacy ECD. EDC, I can't see. ECDC, 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 um, would be where we trial a daycare at that point. But I guess it comes down to like, what are the... I think those are conversations that um, we want to have as an administrative team. What I will say is we're sharing um, the most up-to-date information we just received with you all to be as transparent as possible. But I think these are the types of questions that I think we want to get engagement on. Mm -hmm. I have a thought in my head and uh, about some decisions we can make that could really s set us up. And I, you know, I've gotten some preliminary feedback from folks on my team. But obviously, um, we would we would want to engage in further detailed mm -hmm. conversation. We prioritize the work of the architects for this meeting, but part of the part of the puzzle is ECDC and how do we make sure that we are sustaining a model that doesn't have us continue to pressure put pressure on the space they currently have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yep. if they're larger than the school they're in, how do we create other spaces? And I, and I have some really, uh, I think I have some really solid ideas that can help move that. that. This is the exciting work, mm -hmm. um, but I do think there, with this comes change. I just want to recognize this. This is change. I think some people would say, I saw this four years ago. This isn't like a new thing. However, it's feeling real now, right? And then there are other um, folks that maybe will um, embrace it and say, wow, what an opportunity to kind of look at reorging and having um, more than two sections of a grade so that when we get these uh, ups and downs or ebbs and flows, we can sustain that model. We can create more predictability as a district. So I think there's ways we have to look at this, and people are in different places. 
but I've also tried to divest myself from what, what do I feel like is in the best interest of the district. And when I see these particular plans, um, I think they, they've taken into consideration. We did a lot of work with visioning, those forums, to try to get some feedback. We'll continue to, to share information out, um, but ultimately, you know, I think this positions us well for the years to come, and we're trying to create sustainability. I think we, we have to figure out a way to create sustainability and, and use our facilities efficiently and make sure that we're providing a high quality of service. So I think paired with a healthy budget, this is gonna set us up in the long term. And then I guess my last question, for now anyway, um, <laughs> just any renovation costs or that, that needs to be done, like what, what do we, what are we signing up for? KBA, that's part of what KBA is working on as they, as they finish things up, is what kinds of renovations would need to happen to a school that's a middle school that's now going to house elementary students. And th those are upper really elementary. Upper elementary. Right. Or the other option. Well, that's it. Maybe, maybe there aren't, because it's upper elementary students going into the middle school. Um, you know, so, but again, depending on how many kindergarten classrooms there are in a building, you may need to make some renovations because they generally have to have them within, you know. So those we're we're getting that information, and that's going to be part of that that implementation planning that's going to happen in the next year. They were also going to recommend basically tiered recommendations, like nice to haves. Because I don't know if you uh, recall, but some of the options you were envisioning, we went like pie in the sky, like you know, yeah. really really um, innovative programming, but, but I feel like that would be really tone deaf to our situation to start thinking about some of the options that are existing in different states or different countries. But ultimately, they, they talked about tiering recommendations to say, here are some immediate ones that bring a lot of value. Like, hey, these two undersized classrooms, if you took the wall out in the middle, you've now created a large classroom that's sustainable, right? That's a, that's a larger space. That's like on the short term end. And then long term end is really looking at different spaces and how they're utilized. I think the plan, if we can, if we confirm that we can fit our students in the spaces we stay with our specialized programming, we need to continue to flush out this plan and, and move it forward. But um, I feel as though they're doing that work now. They've looked at it from a map level, and that's what I expect from them as soon as possible. And um, they're going to put together a series of recommendations. So that's a great point. The other piece that is the next part of the meeting was Mr. D'Angelo met with us last week in, in the capital. The capital projects that, that are on the 10-year plan, if a move like this is made, it's just like in your own home. If you were planning to replace a roof at uh, a school, a complex or a school at $10 million, and now you're no longer needing to do that, that's $10 million you're not spending in you know, whatever year, 2027. Because now, you get what I mean? So some of those projects, that are on the table for some of the buildings that we might not utilize in that same way. Uh, wouldn't, uh, does that make sense? So Mike talked about that last meeting a bit. You have more detail now. I see that being part of Tuesday's presentation as well. If you have questions on that, but he basically put together his 10-year capital expenditure plan for every building and every school, and I think we can put out some of that and synthesize that a bit to kind of focus on schools and talk about um, the projects that are on the docket. To get the school, the, the school synthesized version of that. Bob, anything to add to that? No, no, I don't think so. The other document I shared with you was utility costs. Mm -hmm. Someone had asked for that around what does it cost for each building. So if you look, um, we will uh, we, we have that shared around water, electricity, gas, mm -hmm. just to put that out there as well. Mm -hmm. Any decision, I want to be clear that the school committee, if their options, that the, when the options are presented. Any type of action we would need from May all the way through the summer, through the next school year, and into the that's following. So we need two summers basically to plan to implement so that we have all the pieces lined up. And you know, we are not um, unique in this. Every community goes through these evolutions. So I want to normalize a bit of this, but I also feel confident in the plan that um, can really bring us some some opportunity 
as well. Um, so, you know, kind of acknowledging that that exodus of people talking that you mentioned, like going from like the pickup lines going across town mm -hmm. and, and the issues that we can already foresee with that, I I would think that it's more worth spending spending the working hours on this one. Mm -hmm. um, with that being said, a couple of other questions. Um, as far as the Kennedy complex, not complex, building, closing, would you foresee then the same issues of like bringing a building back to life, let's say, as like, oh, we cut a service here and now it's harder to bring it back, right? Like, uh, you know, you wanna have that plan set in a way that that right. building's not then gonna end up a vacant space that we can't, we just can't get the funding to make that, sure. that building happen. Right. Um, so I don't know what the you know so plan looks like in that area, but just something that is coming into my head. So the, the other piece of this too is you have the reality of of our situation is we have two elementary schools that are aging at 60 and 70 years old, right? right. There is a lifetime to those buildings. And I don't want to be the person who just puts blinders on and waits until we're told it's no longer able to be used as a school and then has to make a decision and then, right. and then move students where we have a chance now to be proactive. I heard loud and clear last year, people can get behind ideas as long as we have like a long-term, like a plan and how does this sustain us in the long-term? Yeah. I think that's the goal. So the great question, I would say, just like the example I gave from the neighboring community we went to, they did this reorg. They mm -hmm. had a building unoccupied as a building because they decided at that moment that every student should be considered and reorged at the same time. And right. then they repurposed the building, yeah. rented space to Head Start, have their own daycare, okay. and they have um, other pieces that they, they include there. I don't think yeah. we would want to just leave, you know, but I think your point is there is a lifetime to this. Right. The other piece I would mention is I'm expecting that there will be recommendations for a building project in the future. And okay. what's the next project for Franklin? So all of this is out there. We make these moves, this happens, and on the horizon, there's a recommendation for a future building project, and they are working on those details now. I don't have that to share in this moment. Yeah. But basically, part of the whole recommendation is and we start a steering committee to start to think about the next phase of which, what do we need to build next and when should that occur? Yeah. And, and will it account for the space that we'd be utilizing if, if we close this, a school eventually because it's lived its life? Yeah. Right. Good question. Um, thank you. Um, my next question is kind of you know involving the central middle school. Obviously that's a huge building. Do you? Do you kind of envision that space having grade levels almost being divided up a little bit in a way, you know, kind of mirroring the elementaries in, in, in some respect, just because all of these students who are used to a smaller school environment are now being thrown into a space that is as large as the high school's kind of space, you know, that, yep. that's a bigger, that's a much bigger community than they right. have been exposed to um, and kind of the thought process there. Great questions. Um, it sounds like I feel like you were in one of, one of these thoughts that we've had and, and discussed a bit. We've talked about um, other districts. Some have done, uh, when they do like a new school, say this was just freshly built and you were mm -hmm. consolidating, sometimes you'll see academies, a sixth grade academy and eighth grade. There are options within this that may look at, and I don't know so much that they are uh, voted, like mm -hmm. a, they're operational, but I would say there's opportunity to say, hey, does it make sense for our sixth graders that are just entering middle school to be located on one particular area, like the Oak Street side of a building? Or do you know what I mean? Right. So and we've that's talked like about already have some natural right. divides that maybe can be utilized in a way that. So it's it's about the the sentiment from each forum, and we held two, three, four, five, five forums, two days of visioning, a day of. Um, portrait of a graduate, all of this work that's happened, the feedback from people along the way has all led to the more we can create a community within a larger community, a smaller community within a larger community, mm -hmm. the better for everyone. So right. I think that doesn't um, necessarily cost anything. It's about placing them strategically and purposefully. And as a principal, I was a high school principal, and I had entered the district the, the year after they had closed an elementary school, and redid things. Eighth grade 
ended up at my high school. So we were in eight through 12. That's how, mm -hmm. but that's how their buildings were set up and that's how you could fit people. We're basing this on our fit. What are our resources and how does it make sense for us? But at that time, they decided to put eighth grade in the high school. What I ended up doing is I entered July 1, worked with the superintendent, and we put together a plan to have the eighth grade exist when they walked through the front doors of the, of the high school, they went right up the stairs and there was an eighth grade wing where they were all, right, do you know what I mean? I think we could be thoughtful around these types of things, but that's just one example from next town over. Visited yesterday with a different town, that's our neighbor. So we're in our evolution in Franklin, but just know that these types of, these types of things are occurring um, in, in any town's kind of life cycle. We have we have seen some preliminary building maps, very roughly drawn, but you know, with with grade level wings or floors, um, so that they they are kept together as small communities, and it also allows teachers to collaborate because teachers teaching like subjects or grades are together. Right. So. Okay. Um. I think my last question at the moment. You know, I feel like all through the budget process, we've talked a lot about, a, you know, culture and, you know, a lack of stability from, from not having a healthy budget and all of those types of things. Um, do you, I, I know obviously there's a lot to go into all the planning for this, but as far as planning to, for, for people's own job and job security mm -hmm. issues and retention, knowing a year out, oh, my building's gonna close. You know, how, how are you planning for that to show the transition into the new buildings and, and how that, you know, how that process can maintain a community right. feel um, and the collaborative, the, you know, the collaboration that, that teachers might have had within their, um, within their community-based schools and neighborhood-based schools that they have now? Any decision that, and it sounds like I'm hearing the feedback from you all around like the, the sister school idea or whatnot, but what I'll say is these decisions would mean the staff follow the students. So what do we need to support the kids we have in each of our buildings? And we would continue to do that. We, we've experienced one school closure when the staff follow the students, right? right? Uh, the goal is to Look at this and say, what what are the what, how, how are the number, what's the number of students? What do you need for teachers to educate those students? Mm -hmm. We're trying to stick within our recommended uh, class size guidelines. That's part of the conversation we had last night right. around um, the budget. But ultimately, we would need to organize our staff and look at what are the needs in each particular space in each building, from leadership, administration to teachers, to ESPs, to support, to specialized programs, and how we're organized that way. And I think we uh, that's part of the charge of when, you know, and we're already thinking about this, yeah. you know, but ultimately you need to vote on, on a decision, and that's gonna help kick, it's like a domino effect. That actually helps us get pretty real about who's in charge of that building. Now ultimately I know that this creates a bit of uncertainty, and um, you know, we've had conversations with our team around, you know, you basically a decision made now and then a year from now yeah there's a lot that can happen but uh, I wouldn't say that uh, I don't I wouldn't want to put un unnecessary fear into anyone around job security because we need educated it's we're a human business and we need our educators to educate our kids Absolutely. will there be um, some opportunities when you merge schools to not have duplicative roles of course that's just the nature of this and every town that's done this before us. But we're really sensitive to wanting to make sure that we're thoughtful and we go through you know, the, the process and try to preserve as much as we can that's within reason. It's also within uh, what we're able to support and what's most appropriate for us to provide the education. So it's kind of that. Right. That and I'm sure that ultimately too, you know, combining these schools moving to a, a larger building community is actually will ultimately create more stability since as yes. you said three kids less in, in a class in a year isn't going to impact in the same way that right. that it would have at a smaller school um, and we've experienced I think uh, you know just we've experienced we experience it every year when you have 
you're <coughs> teachers and you're on the right. cusp. I've mentioned this before in budget conversations. It does, it puts you in a really precarious situation because you end up with a class size of 25 and you didn't go into it with that. So I do think there is something to be said for that. The last piece I'll mention, and I'll, I open it up to the team too if anyone has any, any other information they want to share. Um, the um, we have folks who travel mm -hmm. to different schools. We have folks that are split between multiple buildings. I think there's opportunity to examine all of that as well. And if you start to think about this from either configuration, you know, it's about how do we utilize our resources to the you know human and our supplies and resources and materials and how we're organized. I think there's opportunity there. So. I'd open it up to anyone else who wants to chime in on it. Yeah, and one thing I'd just love if we can include like potential busing efficiencies, because I can mm -hmm. I could see that here, especially where busing going from the middle school drop off or pickups and drop offs and then now the elementary school you're not going all these different places, you know, like it's, it's at least one location, so I think right. we, we may see some efficiencies and savings and... You know. Basically, it's like you're going out to more houses, right. but you're, you're going to one location, so yeah. there's all of that, and that's part of the conversation. One thing, it's one of these things where it's like a push-pull, you need information in order right. to, and yeah. then we need to keep planning. Mm -hmm. And if we came to you with a completely buttoned up plan, it would need, it would have to, that would mean we would have had to have a direction. Mm -hmm. So I think for the community, I know I can already envision someone saying, you need more info, or, well, we have a lot of info, we've done a lot of work to get to this stage, here's the subcommittee, here's the information. We, Al, I appreciate your comment around how you feel as a member around the idea of the sister schools versus the other. That helps us kind of think where do we want to put our resources in presenting information? But ultimately, these are the two options that are actually viable. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you remember from that 2020 report, it did say viable with a master plan. Mm -hmm. So anything in there that didn't say viable is not even on the table. But I do think there were some things in there that with a master plan, what they meant was we need to get up off the tables, back away, and sit back down. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, kind of move forward that way. The last thing. We're in a, we are in a uh, decline in our enrollment that we've seen over many years. And Steve, I know you've been a part of a lot of conversations about this along the way. I'd love to give you a shout out once in a while. We're going to continue to see, as a district, yeah, as a district, we're going to see, and I mentioned this last night, but I would just reiterate, we're going to continue to decline overall all through 2032, right? The high school's on that same trajectory. The middle school is on a trajectory to decline overall until 2029. And the middle, uh, the elementary is projected to decline until 2026, except then it stabilizes and it doesn't climb more than 100. And that's based off of 60 new houses per year, I wanna be clear. But the trend is what I'm talking about. We're on a downward stabilizing trend. We're not on an, a climb. So if a move like this was happening, I don't think I would be here recommend, I would not be supporting a recommendation from an architect if I didn't think that we weren't looking at down to stable and then climb. And I think that's where, if there's any type of future building, I want them to be considering that. So that's on the table as well, and that's not a surprise that we have that in the mix. So um, I'll leave it at that and you know, continue the conversation. Um, one note, just of oh, Al's kind of comment, just about the efficiencies with um, busing. Just kind of curious. I know uh, the cuts for the middle school programming last year. There was yeah. a lot. There was there was a lot to it. Um, finances were, were one, and then just trying to organize yeah. like the late bus was a whole extra complexity, and trying to do that would just require even more money that, that we didn't have. Mm -hmm. Having just one centralized middle school, especially one that's right next to the high school, could that potentially, could that make that an easier option to bring back the middle school clubs? So I will say this, operating three clubs at three schools, which required three bus routes and three buses, mm -hmm. created a bit of a challenge. We know that they would dismiss, so if school got out at 210, mm -hmm. 310 the club ends, the bus wouldn't get there sometimes till 330, 
for you. Just, just to be clear, sometimes that happened because they had to do all these other runs of their elementaries, and uh, there was a lot to that. So that was one piece of it. The other piece was we had to make cuts because it was that or cut some, something else. So you have to make these tough decisions, and we did that. Uh, having the high school, because the bus ridership is different there at the high school, but they're consolidated to have clubs, when you have over 700 kids participating in clubs and activities and paying a fee, it self-funds the, the course. Like, a cut wouldn't have been necessary. It would have been performative after we did the math. At the elementary, at the middle, it wasn't, we were, we were spending money beyond, it wasn't self-sustaining, and the, and the buses were, killed, were, were really um, impacting our ability to run. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I just want to be clear about it. It was a timing and a fundamental issue. The middle school principals would stay late, you know, not stay, they're, they're always working, but you know what I mean? They would be there until 3.40 having to supervise when mm -hmm. that's a prime time for a principal to call families, get, get your stuff mm -hmm. out, right? That idea, so. Yeah. And I mean, logistically, I think it's, it would be easier at that one location because mm -hmm. if whatever bus is free, since it's going to one middle school and all the middle school kids are going on that same bus anyway, mm -hmm. it's easier right. to just kind of, okay, well, I'm running late, you know, Dave, the bus driver, he can pick it up and sell. You know, like, I think there's more flexibility. Yes, there is, and the other piece is we have to look at the traffic for drop-off arrival and dismissal at a middle school and a high school being on the same property. There are other towns that have the same model, so that we're not in reinventing the wheel, but we want to be thoughtful around that type of start. But then I would argue that is there an opportunity for a late bus where maybe there's some shared late buses that go to certain locations in town that pick up at both in this model. So there's some ways to look at this. Yeah. I just would say that it's like, once again, it's the push-pull. Mm -hmm. Once we start honing in on the direction and get to some decisions, we can start to plan ahead and move forward. And mm -hmm. I think that's what we, I think that's what the community wants from us, is to make some decisions, take some actions, and then be thoughtful in the planning. And, and give us enough time to plan this and communicate out what's happening. But you know, this is one of those moments, I think, in this process where we're putting down tangibly and we need to communicate this out you know, soon and then Tuesday get it out just to get it on people's radar on what we're talking about mm -hmm. and then thoughtfully plan. I think Further, with, with the transportation, you even have the opportunity to look at possibility of moving from three tiers to two tiers. Can, um, can you explain that to folks so they understand? Yeah, there, there's basically three three runs of the buses. There's there's an elementary run, a middle school run, and a high school run. You potentially, because the high school and the middle school are, are close to each other, you could pair those two to be 15 minutes apart to avoid the traffic. But effectively, they're a single tier, and then all those buses go off to the elementary schools. Or you could pair the high school with <coughs> elementary, potentially, um, middle school with, with high, uh, elementary, potentially, and find, find a way to just do this as two tiers. It may require more buses, but the number of runs would be less, and that would minimize some costs. Yeah. So we, we would explore all of that um, in the process of our planning for next year, but I think there's opportunity for some savings there um, to simplify the transportation system. Can you just clarify, so it, this wouldn't mean that if we consolidate it to two tiers that a middle school student and a high school student would be on the same bus at the same no. time? No, they would, they would no. be in their own, own schools that have their own. What I, what I would envision is 15 minute later start time for one versus the other. Okay. Um, and it, they would just be running basically staggered. Okay, thank you. So would that impact school start times as well? It may. Huh. It may. I think I think it I think it would. <laughs> I but I also think in this particular in these particular examples, we have an opportunity to look at that, engage a little bit more, mm -hmm. but look at what makes the most sense. If everyone's being kind of sitting back down at their table, is there a chance to look at these times and think about traffic and think about dismissal and arrival and try to offset middle and high if they're on Oak, because we all know, I know what it's like on Oak Street, you know, at, cool. <laughs> at that time of day, we know that. But we know that because we have uh, Oak Street Elementary starting after Horace Mann, 
high school horse man right now currently are basically within a very short window of time together. Mm -hmm. I drop my children off when I can at both schools. I have to pull into one, pull into the other. So I know that feeling. It's existing now. What I'd say is when you start to add more middle schools to the, you're now having more people converge. Mm -hmm. So I think one, a couple of concepts that need to be further thought out is transportation in general and what that could look like. Start times to try to stagger where we anticipate large swells of uh, vehicles and buses at any particular location, right? We have to think about um, the, uh, obviously the planning of this and kind of where students would, would land. You have to basically, in essence, start to move students. If they're gonna be vacating one uh, school building and moving into another, where does that land? What is that, you know, what school do they attend? And um, just continue to work through this process and you know, I think we're prepared and ready, and that's been the focus of the work and we're working on a few things right now. But this is certainly one of the um, areas where we put a lot of time in this year. Saying you've been busy, <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> just, just a wee bit. Um, no, and I, I really appreciate that sentiment as well. You know, because I think back to you know, I think the past three school committee terms, there's been one kind of big decision about you know, uh, they would say, or redistricting, and now this as well, that one, a lot of the things that kind of came back from the forum was that people were like, all right, we can understand if maybe something's happening that isn't our most favorite, you know, thing, if the kids get redistricted or we've changed the school start times, but to kind of, to know that it's being done purposefully for, that kind of reaches this long-term goal, I think is fantastic, because I think that I know just as a, as a parent to not have to keep hearing about that one new thing, about that, that possible you know, next new redistricting, the next mm -hmm. new school closure, those, all this stuff, yeah. just every, every, you know, new, every 18 months, um, and instead to kind of be able to kind of broadcast out and say, this is the direction, here's you know, how we're, you know, the steps we're gonna do to get there, and here's you know, that in 10 years, this is what we're looking for. So I think like, to, to your comment about like, you know, if you have to like build it back, it's kind of like that future proofing where we can look at those enrollment trends and say that some of the decisions that we are, we're going to make, you know, with, within the school term, uh, the, the school committee term, that it's sustainable all the way through, you know, for the next 10 years. That we're not going to make a decision uh, without looking at those enrollment numbers, you know, for instance, to say, all right, well, we went, we went, did this one decision, and then it created this other problem that we now have to kind of fix and do all over again. You know, we're not looking at, you know, the KBA that isn't, you know, taking into account the specialized services. It's kind of throwing off the facilities uh, numbers and stuff. It's, it's, a, it's a wide view of everything, but with that long-term goal to say we can actually make some choices that can stick for the next 10 years yeah. without anyone having to try to, to panic to, to fix another problem that it created. And not to say that anything that we, that we do is going to be perfect. Yeah. You know, there's going to be, you know, tweaks and adjustments all along the way, but at least I, I love the idea that we might be able to have something that can just, we can put up for the whole community to say for the next 10 years, this is the progress that the schools are going to make, and here's how we're going to get there, and here's the cost savings that are involved, here's what we'll be able to bring back, and new revenue ideas we can bring in. So I just, I, I, I really love that long-term vision that's coming from. When I think of a year ago, and I think about the school committee and the want and desire to have a comprehensive plan that take, took into consideration you know, all these aspects, to, I feel I felt responsible to deliver on that this year. That was clear from the meeting we had last May was, look, we appreciate the work that went in, and Al, I know you were directly, you know, closely involved with that. We appreciate the work, but I think we need to zoom out and look at this more holistically. This is the result of looking at things more holistically and have more of a long-range plan. And if that, I, I felt strongly like I understood the assignment very clearly by the time we ended the school year. <laughs> Spent hours and hours and hours in redistricting last year and respected the decision. And now here we are a year later with what I feel is a more comprehensive look. And comprehensive means all-encompassing, right? Mm -hmm. So we've now encompassed and thought about every single school and every building and have tried to land with a plan that really sets us up to move forward. So that's what I would say, just to honor the work of you, 
both and the previous school committee and our current school committee to me I, I want to see us make you know get some decisions on the table that set us up for success as we move forward in a sustainable model leveraging the square footage we need to work to operate I think this does it. so Thank you. please stepping back in the I think your summary was good because I was going to go somewhere there. So you already did that. That's fine. A prior school committee before COVID was looking more in detail around the start times issues, particularly with the high school as part of the health. Mental health is still an issue. Potentially bringing that back and putting it on the roadmap to the extent that mental health is still an issue. To the extent that if you instead of going three tier, you're going two tier, then it's just a switch. Still an adjustment. But I think it's better. It, it's it's an item that should at least be out there mm -hmm. for the radar going forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and thank you very much for kind of bringing that up. I think if you thought that you were busy now, <laughs> <laughs> the well, next year, yeah. yeah. I think there's a logic to this recommendation. Mm -hmm. You know uh, that I think your point, Steve, is if there is if, if things are happening it's like when you move your furniture around if you already have the stuff out of the room it's a good time to vacuum and clean mm -hmm. and do different things I would use that analogy again to say what else is out there that we need to be thinking about but automatic inherent in this decision is going to have to be a conversation around when schools start as it relates to busing and um, traffic mm -hmm. that has to be that has to be a guarantee so I agree with you it's an opportunity at that moment you know we were thinking about this from the lens of these new configurations, mm -hmm. but but if we're truly trying to be comprehensive, that's worth a, a future conversation as well. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Any other questions, comments? So I know everyone's feelings, and, and I wholly agree with the the big green that uh, option too. Just to kind of toss that aside, um, you all kind of feel comfortable putting option one. Uh, green on top, blue on the bottom. Uh, moving forward to Tuesday's school committee meeting. Uh, not for, and just for, so we can kind of continue to elaborate this discussion, mm -hmm. but as something, is that something that entertain a motion? Uh, but that's something that we, uh, we think is a valid option to kind of move forward and to put on the docket for Tuesday for the whole school committee to kind of review and for the public to get more input. Yeah, back on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then, and uh, just a que like a question: mm -hmm. Do you anticipate on Tuesday having this to present to the the full committee and the community, or do you mm -hmm. anticipate having more information in that would supplement any of these areas? We and I'll let just uh, as I want to expect. I'll let Bob chime in as well. But we expect our master planner to be providing more information prior to the meeting. We okay. anticipate being able to add additional detail. Um, but this is the this is the core. Yeah. I think this is what everyone's waiting on. But we certainly right. want to provide as much information as possible to have a thoughtful conversation. So we will yeah. fill in the uh, the information around this in an effort to present. To, um, and the only other thing I wanted to mention was oh timeline. I think we want to if this is the. If this is the way we're moving, mm -hmm. we did, I know that you would have seen an email that came out from me on, I think it was the 24th or something. Sure. Yeah, just that talked about this meeting yeah. and wanted to give as much information as possible and then move to the Tuesday meeting. So we're in line with what's been communicated previously, mm -hmm. but I do think maybe a follow-up communication from me about what's been discussed in this meeting for our staff and community would, would be uh, a good thing to do because we did commit during those forums that we would share information when we have it. We've now discussed this a bit, so I plan to put out some communication about the concepts that were discussed here at a, at a, at a you know, high level and ask people to tune in on Tuesday, mm -hmm. just to reinvite them and remind them. Because we you know, we're really trying to be thoughtful here. This has been a long road and we're arriving at some decisions, and, but I recognize also that for some folks that are just kind of engaging this might be new information so um, and I think the timeline is important too to say re remind people any recommendation or option that's put forth would require us to utilize the 24 25 school year to implement any op any option that's rec that's voted does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah okay so I want to get that out and just keep that keep that moving. 
No, I think that's great. I think um, a colleague, uh, Dr. Griffith, had basically mentioned, you know, really kind of more that we can kind of broadcast the work that we're doing here. Even myself. Mm -hmm. really, really just not the great one. Um, then uh, I may just uh, formally, uh, well, entertain a motion uh, for this subcommittee for a recommendation of option one, green on top, blue on bottom. Uh, is there a second? second? Discussion? Debate? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. Motion passes. Oh, I have a gavel. Appreciate it. All right. Um, and so I know, so then right now we have uh, the next uh, meeting. This would be uh, presented. Mr. Then Chair, if I may, just oh, a quick please. clarification. While the folks listening don't have the coloring. Can you expand on what that option one really means in terms of the alignment of the elementary schools? You are fantastic. I don't know what we do without you. Appreciate it. Uh, so just to be clear, and I'm sure we can kind of we can put this out as well quickly. Uh, but that option one, uh, this would have uh, the Annie Sullivan uh, Keller complex become the North North Elementary School, a K to five. Um, complex. It would have uh, the uh, Remington Jefferson complex become the South Elementary School, again, K to 5. Uh, Franklin High School stays as is. Um, the ECDC Oak and Horace Mann become the Central Middle School. No. No, no I apologize. I apologize. Uh, sorry. Uh, Oak and Horace Mann. Yes. become the Central Middle School. Um, and then we have ECDC, but we also have the ECDC expansion, uh, which would go into where Kennedy currently is. Um, and then Parmenter would be taken offline alongside Davis Thayer. All right, and so again, that's just for the community. Uh, that was the option one uh, that was uh, just voted on. And we will be sure to broadcast that out with this image uh, in the email later today. Yeah. 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 We, can, we can put that up. Um, and you want to, just to be clear, there were two options that the architect says are viable. But this committee, I'm hearing very clearly, you, you already know off the bat you want to go with the, which is basically in line with the feedback forms we already had that um, Mr. Charles mentioned and that you just got. That's the one we're going to put out. I think that makes sense. Correct. And I think uh, on Tuesday, like we can, you know, so information will be available in, in the packet. The school committee the itself can kind of go and, and look at it as well. Um, but yeah, it's this option, option one this, right here. This would be the recommendation from this, committee. this committee. That's just correct. the process. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions, comments? So uh, as it also stands right now, the next meeting that we had uh, was scheduled for May 1 mm -hmm. um, at 5 o'clock. Yeah. Do we still want to kind of maintain that yeah, one? Yes, it is. Okay. Yep. All right. Then uh, unless there's any other questions or comments, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All right, passes. Thank you all very much. Thank you. We are now producing this in collaboration with Franklin TV and Franklin Public Radio. This podcast is my public service effort for Franklin, but we can't do it alone. We can always use your help. How can you help? If you can use the information that you find here, please tell your friends and neighbors. If you don't like something here, please let me know. Through this feedback loop, we can continue to make improvements. And I thank you for listening. For additional information, please visit franklinmatters.org. If you have questions or comments, you can reach me directly at suresteve at gmail.com. The music for the intro and exit was provided by Michael Clark and the group East of Shirley. The piece is titled Ernesto Manana, copyright Michael Clark and Tin Type Tunes in 2008, and used with their permission. I hope you enjoy. By the way, you can also subscribe and listen to Franklin Matters Radio on your favorite podcast app. Search in podcasts for Franklin Matters.